Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Will Pomerantz and I am the director of the Kennan Institute. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today to discuss uh, Mark Pomar's new book, Cold War Radio, uh, which examines how the United States waged the Cold War through international broadcasting of Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I also want to thank the History and Public Policy Program for co-sponsoring today's event. And I encourage everyone to stay up to date with our latest Kennan Institute publications, including our blogs, Focus Ukraine and the Russia File, and our new Russian language blog, In Other Words. Uh, you can also sub subscribe to our podcast, Kennan X and also the Russia File. And finally, also visit our Hindsight Upfront collection on the Wilson, Ce Wilson Center website for the latest news and analysis focused on Ukraine. If you have any questions for today's speaker, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom rather than raising your hand. We will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the event and we'll move to your questions following the presentation. And I would like to begin though by introducing my longtime colleague and friend, Mark Pomar. He is currently a senior fellow at the Clemens Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, from 1982 to 1993, Mark worked as Assistant Director of the Russian Service at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and as Director of the USSR Division of Voice of America. Uh, Mark previously served also as a Senior Executive and President of IREX from 2008 and 2007 and was the founding CEO and president of the US Russia Foundation. So if anyone is an experienced Russia hand, it is Mark Pomar. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Will. And I, let me just add that I was very proud to be a Kennan Fellow. Uh, 29 years ago, I spent a wonderful year at the Kennan Institute and uh, did some research and writing, and it was really one of the happier years in my life. Um, what I'd like to do is very briefly sketch out why I wrote the book and, in a sense, what the main themes of the book are, and then open it up to questions. I think that's going to be the more exciting part to really get engaged, uh, especially with an audience, I'm sure, that knows knows the Cold War, knows the radios, knows U.S.-Russia, U.S.-Soviet relations. So it would be fun to get your input as well. Very briefly, I wrote the book for, for one or two reasons, really. One, when you know you hit 70 years of age, you kind of look back over your life and you think, well, have I really, what are the most important elements that I have experienced? And I, and I realized that I was very fortunate, very, very fortunate to have been, not only had a front row seat, but in many ways to participate in the last 11 years of the Cold War. I started in 1982, I left in 1993. And I saw in the course of the, really the end of the Soviet empire, the freeing of Eastern Europe and Central Europe, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And I was part of it. And I wanted to reflect not so much my own personal life, which I don't think is of that particular interest, but rather the fact that I was able to be part of this process to observe it. And in some cases to actually uh, make decisions, participate in it. And I wanted to reflect that in the book. The other reason for writing about it is because so few people really know what Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and VOA are. They kind of make up their own explanations as to what it is. And just to give you a small reminder, a very distinguished colleague of, uh, of ours at a Ivy League University about a year ago in Foreign Affairs wrote something and he mentioned uh, Radio Liberty. And I read it and I realized he doesn't know what he is talking about. So I wrote a very polite, very nice letter to the gentleman and said, you know, you really should should read, you know, my book at the very least if you're going to be making statements about what Radio Liberty broadcast in the 1970s or 80s. So I wanted to bring that sort of essence of what the radio does to the reader and to have them make up their own minds as to whether they thought it was valuable or not. And the third reason, and I think one that may be of greater interest to a lot of the listeners at a Canon Institute um, Zoom meeting, is that Radio Liberty in particular, VOA to a lesser degree, 
were really repositories of Russian political culture, history, arts, literature, music. By through its censorship, the Soviet Union, in a sense, and I write in the book, ceded kind of the political ground of public discourse on Russia's future, on Russia's past, where it was going. And what the radios were, were in a sense, the open public forum debate as to what is happening in the Soviet Union, what is happening with Russia, and more important, where is it heading? What will be its possible future? Uh, you know, the thing that people on the outside may not know about the radios is the extent and the breadth of different political views that were expressed within the radios. You know, we had a few old time monarchists for sure. We had a few socialists who really were Mensheviks or children of Mensheviks who really saw socialists. And we had a lot of people in between. And really to work at the radios was to be immersed, I would say, in the vortex of Russian political history and culture. Like you, Will, I, I have a PhD in Russian history and literature. I thought I knew a lot when I got to the radios in 82, and I realized I knew very little because what I had read was abstract. These people lived it. They lived it every day. They could quote you whatever their favorite philosophers were, their favorite writers. They embodied it. And, and I think I wanted to communicate in the book that this was living, uh, thriving, uh, political culture, if you wish. And, and to be part of that was to really gain a deep sense of, of the problems and the, and the difficulties by, by, uh, of, of Russian political culture. So I wanted to communicate that. Now, the way I structured the book, I have two rather opening scene setting chapters uh, about how the radio started, how VOA and RFERL emerged. It's a very interesting part. Uh, this is just a kind of a uh, sketch, if you wish. Uh, but I do get into some of the early Russian broadcasts. There's a, quite a bit of declassified documents, thanks to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I want to thank the uh, Cold War Center at Woodrow Wilson that has been so instrumental in declassifying a lot of documents, which gave me an opportunity to cite them, especially to the late Ross Johnson, a good friend of mine who, who worked at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And that, I think, gives a little bit of a taste for how these Russian services, uh, both at VOA and RFERL, emerged. But the real heart of the book, I mean, the real core of what I wanted to communicate was the chapters on programming. And, and that's really kind of sits at the, at the very base and heart of the book. And I have a chapter on, I start with human rights. I mean, human rights and everything associated with human rights was at the core of everything the radios did every single day. Uh, these could be in the 1970s and 80s, the reading of Samizdat. Andrei Sakharov was on Radio Liberty practically every day, not necessarily physically, but his works, his letters, his um, uh, works about him. Uh, you know, the whole... And a Jewish refusenik movement. I mean, you could not have any information were it not for the radios broadcasting day in and day out about trials, about people sent. I write about Marchenko, for example, the, the prisoner of prisoners who spent so many years. Every, you know, the, these were documents. Some is that the whole relationship of some is that in the radios is very important because the some is that materials would come out of the Soviet Union go to Munich, be rebroadcast into the Soviet Union, recorded by people on primitive tape recorders, and then distributed as Magnitizda. And so you had this virtuous circle going from the Soviet Union to the radios, back to the Soviet Union, and you had that, that loop that in many ways changed so much of the Soviet Union. So human rights, uh, I do talk about human rights bo programming both at Radio Liberty and at VOA, and here, I do make the point that at VOA, during detente, it was very hard to broadcast about, about human rights. I mean, I found documents, again, declassified, where the uh, director of the U.S. Information Agency, James Keogh, under Nixon and Ford, somebody said, we, we don't want to broadcast social needs, and that's too provocative. It's going to upset our agenda. I have another document where Alexander Haig, who was then Nixon's um, 
um, chief of staff coming to the VOA and telling them, well, you know, Nixon's going to, to, to the Soviet Union. You really got to tame down this into human rights stuff. We don't want it. Of course, caused a tremendous backlash at VOA saying you are obviously interfering with a legal, uh, the U uh, VOA operates under the VOA charter. So the detente years are really for VOA very tough years, I think, in, in, especially in programming having to do with the Soviet Union, having to do with human rights, having to do with dissidents. So that chapter, I think, is, is, a, is an important one. The next one is on culture and arts. And, and here, I think, uh, to many people, I, I quote Ivan Tolstoy, who's currently a senior editor at um, Radio Liberty in Prague, who told me, you cannot study Russian literature without Radio Liberty, because Russian literature is embedded in Radio Liberty, in particular, quite a bit in VOA as well. I mean, we had every writer. Uh, Sinyavsky had his own program on Radio Liberty. Um, you can't study Bulata Kudrava or Alexander Galich or Vladimir Vysotsky without, without Radio Liberty because they were on virtually all the time. I, in doing research, and, and you, this is available online, so anybody can just go online and listen to these programs. There's nothing secretive about it at all. Uh, I, I would sometimes spend the whole day just listening to Galich programs hour after hour because it was just so entertaining and so interesting. Got no writing done that day, but it was, it was a fun day. Uh, there are 500 uh, Galich programs where he would go into the studio with his guitar, sing, talk, philosophize, entertain, and there, there you had a program. Or Sinyavsky had a fantastic program in the mid-70s, which I found rather, where you would talk not just about literature, but so much about culture and history of, the, of, of, of Russia. So these are all embedded in, in, in uh, Radio Liberty programming. And I think that comes as a great surprise to people who always think of the radios as being news, news, news. And I, and I tell them, yes, of course, news was important. But that's maybe 30% of the broadcast. 70% of what the radios broadcast was all kinds of different stories, from music to pop music to the Beatles. Um, all the Beatles were, were broadcast on both Radio Liberty and VOA in the 60s. Why do you think Soviets knew all about American and American interests and so forth? Because they was all on, on the radios every day. And those tended not to be jammed. So a lot of the, the kind of more musical programs uh, were um, quite accessible to, to people in the Soviet Union. And I remember people coming up to me in the 1990s, older listeners, and say, you know, I really fell in love with Johnny Cash or with Simon and Garfunkel. It's all thanks to VOA. This is what, what turned me, that person, on to American things. So there were reviews of movies. There were, you know, the latest uh, fashions. I mean, there was a lot in the radio that had nothing to do with politics or news. And that's something that really strikes people as being very, very unusual. And they, for the most part, they don't know that. My next chapter after culture and arts, and by the way, one could write a whole book on culture and arts. I just skim it because the material is so rich and so overwhelming that you could really write several books about it. The next chapter I have is one that I think is extremely relevant to today. And that's a chapter on history. Both radios, but especially Radio Liberty, always had a history program. And that history program reflected in the case of Radio Liberty, uh, a lot of different views, including uh, more conservative views, uh, especially in the 80s. And, and we can get into that in the question and answer if you're interested as to why there was such a conservative movement in, the, in terms of programming in the 80s. Um, I'll tell you very, uh, just as a, you know, in his uh, speech, uh, few weeks ago uh, when Putin an annexed um, illegally the territories in Ukraine, he quoted only one Russian philosopher, Mr. Ivan Ilin. Well, I got to know Mr. Ivan Ilin very well at the radios because he was a subject of tremendous controversy. He had been uh, featured in some of the programs or about him. There were people at the radios thought that he should not be at all in the programs. And so I was thrown into the mix. And one of my first assignments as assistant director of the Russian service is go figure out what this program should be doing. And, and, and so I sat there reading Ilin for, for hours in 1982. Uh, and um, 
it's kind of curious to see him reappearing so prominently in Putin's Russia. We can get to that as well in the question and answer period. So history becomes controversial, becomes interesting. Different editors take it in different directions. I, I do point out that we had a rather conservative editor, Alexander Brar, who really kind of trumpeted the more conservative Slavophile line. We had another very good editor, uh, Vladimir Tors, uh, an emigre who I think really raised the program to a very, very high level, where you really had the key issues of histor historiography in the West as it's reflecting in terms of the Soviet Union. There is a separate chapter after history on Solzhenitsyn, and, and that, of course, is another very big part of what we could be discussing. I had the privilege of spending three days with, with Solzhenitsyn, as he read from 1914, the Stalipin chapters, which are actually quite good. I, I have to admit that the whole red wheel cycle I found rather unwieldy and, and never really got into it. And just But the Stalipin chapters, if anybody wants to read rather sort of Solzhenitsyn at his artistic best. I think that is clearly, I think, the chapters. And he read them to me for three days, sitting across the desk from me. And we had an engineer, a VOA a technician who recorded it. And I think what was interesting in that for a couple of reasons. One, Solzhenitsyn was a figure that was, as I said earlier, not allowed or at least minimized on VOA. And here he was on the air. It also created a lot of noise and controversy to the point where even the Washington Post wrote a whole article about the controversies in the Russian service of VOA over the, over the broadcast of Solzhenitsyn's work. And it brought out a lot of the kind of controversies that we still see today in terms of those who saw Solzhenitsyn as a nationalist uh, figure who was trying to bring Russia or the Soviet Union at that time back to a kind of a great Russia and of course, opposed by the more liberal um, uh, forces in, in, in the Soviet Union who saw that as a backward direction. So that chapter uh, sort of spells out the difficulty also, the difficulty of, um, of putting on a controversial figure and how to deal with it. And the last programming chapter, per se, is called religion. And I would wager that even people who claim to know what the radios were broadcasting, would not know anything about any religious program. As a matter of fact, uh, my old colleague, Alan Heil, uh, who wrote a book on VOA that's about 400 pages or so, does not even mention the word religion in the entire 400-page book. Uh, there have been books written about Radio Liberty that don't mention it. And yet, beginning at the very beginning, religious programs were fundamental to the programming. Uh, religious services, sermons. We had a separate Orthodox program run by Orthodox priest at VOA. We had a separate Jewish program run by the superb Jewish programming. I mean, to the point where we actually received, I actually went and received a human rights award from uh, organization in support of Soviet Jewry in the mid 1980s because of the outstanding program that VOA did on, on the whole Jewish program. And it was very... You know, I listened to, to, to both the, the Orthodox, listen to them again. You know, I had heard them, obviously, when I worked there, but to go back and listen to them. And, and they were, and I tell this with a certain amount of um, sort of uh, kind of that we broke all the notion of, of church and state because these programs were fundamentally very religious. They, they were not ecumenical. They were not talking about... Um, broad issues of personal belief. They were faith-based programming. And I think that is uh, 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 something that we should acknowledge. Uh, some may like it, some may not, but that was an important part of what we were doing. And by the way, we were attacked more often than not for our religious programming. So if you look at the Soviet attacks in the press against the radios, there were two favorite topics. There was attack the radios because of youth programming. You are seducing our youth from the socialist path and taking them into horrible ways with all of your programming on pop music and so forth. And the other very, very salient uh, point that they would make is your religious programs. You are infusing us with these religious programs and again, for leaving 
people astray. So that chapter, not very long, but that chapter, I try to illustrate something that I don't think anyone else has ever spoken about the radios, and yet they were so fundamental to, to the radios. The next chapter is Glasnost, uh, which um, is interesting for a number of reasons. One, because I participated in the very first discussions of the end of jamming in uh, the mid-1980s. I went to the Soviet Union with a colleague in 1987 as the first employee of the radios. I was at the Board of International Broadcasting to have ever gone to the Soviet Union to discuss um, you know, political issues. And we were housed at the embassy for fear that there might be an incident. It could be Ambassador Matlock was very concerned that we remain on the on the grounds of the of the embassy. And the, the gist of it, I describe it in the, in the book, is that nobody would meet with us. And all the meetings that Ambassador Matlock had set out for us, nobody, but nobody in September of 1987 would sit down with two representative of the radios, even though we had gotten a visa and we were able to go. One year later, we went as part of the USIA uh, information talks. Uh, led by Charlie Wick and had a whole boast of, and there we met with Mr. Fallin, uh, Valentin Fallin, uh, who then headed Ria Novosti, but before that had been ambassador to West Germany, Soviet ambassador. And he looked across and Mr. Forbes, uh, as chair of the board joined us, he looked across from us and he said, we have noticed an improvement in the programming of Radio Liberty. And I could tell that he, it pained him to say that. I mean, his whole life was sort of built on the Radio Liberty and VOA as the eternal enemies. And here he was sitting in Moscow telling two, three representatives of the radios that he had noticed an improvement. And indeed, one month later, the uh, jamming stopped. And that opened up a whole new era for the radios because we were able to open bureaus, we were able to hire freelancers, we were able to cover the entire Soviet Union. And it's the most dramatic moment, and one I can describe in the book is, of course, the 1991 putsch, when the only radio stations able to operate in the entire Soviet Union were the radios, with Radio Liberty, VOA, BBC, that had established bureaus and hired freelancers. And Radio Liberty actually had a live connection wire, telephone wire to the Russian White House. And it had Yeltsin on there. It was reporting from within the White House. It had journalists reporting from the crowds in Moscow. And that's sort of the moment of most kind of um, amazing success that nobody would have ever, uh, ever expected. And then sort of quickly, just to leave time for questions, I can come back to a number of these stories. But by 1990, Two, we had bureaus everywhere. Yeltsin issued a, declare, a decree claiming that Radio Liberty had played an important and heroic role during the putsch and during the whole that period. Uh, just to finish up, on the 40th anniversary of Radio Liberty, it was celebrated in the famous House of Writers in Moscow. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev himself came. And I was very privileged to be his interpreter that evening. And he spent about an hour with us chatting in the most normal way, explaining how important he, we didn't remind him about jamming and, and he didn't really raise the question of jamming, but uh, it was a magical evening, especially given everything that we've seen since that, that Radio Liberty in particular had come from being derided, scorned, attacked, bombed in 1981, people assassinated in the 1950s and 60s, just sitting in Moscow uh, with a former general secretary celebrating the 40th anniversary of, of its existence. So I think I could talk for a long time, but I think at 25 minutes I shall stop and we can open it up to questions and discussion. Thank you very much, much Mark. Uh, again, if you have a, a question for uh, Mark Pomar, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom rather than raising your hand, and we'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the event, and we'll give, give, give you opportunity to ask your questions shortly. I'm going to take the liberty as moderator to ask the first question, though. Um, in reviewing your book and reading your book, obviously there were a lot of familiar names and familiar uh, personalities. And I just want to ask you how you mediated between all these different groups and all these different opinions 
as you managed these radios? Uh, how did you make sure that everyone had fair access to the radios uh, without necessarily uh, being partial to one, one side or one faction? That's a very important question because the passions ran high and uh, emigre politics are some of the most strident and uh, tough politics you can imagine. And one had to be, you know, rather careful to do that. I'll give you an example. So uh, Lyudmila Alexeyeva, whom I greatly admire as a great human rights um, activist and writer and so forth, uh, of course, criticized us very harshly for, for putting Solzhenitsyn on the air and giving him so much airtime. So my response was, you know, Lyudmila uh, Mihailovna, why don't you come and have your own program at Radio Liberty? You can have you know, you're, you're 45 minutes on the air every every week, and, and we respect what you do, and we think it's very important. And one thing I tried, and by the way, far and away, I didn't persuade everyone. I really tried and to, to explain that we are going to be better off having a diversity of opinion rather than trying to push one line. And, and this, by the way, was not necessarily greeted by everyone. There were people uh, in management who really wanted to push one line. This is our line. This is what we want to say. There was another group to which I belonged, which said, look, we should do the whole span. We should have conservative voices. We should have very liberal voices. We should find ways in which to, to bring about, if not dialogue, then at least a, a listener can hear different points of view. Now, that became much easier once jamming ceased, because the argument always during jamming was, it will be a distorted story and they'll think that you're pushing, you know, Ivan Ilin's ideas uh, rather than discussing them in the in a broader context. But I think, you know, I try to, I don't go into a lot of the, the scandals and the, and the denunciations and the problems, but there were, and they were either done because people passionately believed in their views or because these were Soviet agents or agents of influence who were also there to disrupt our work. So, uh, it was not an easy thing to do, and I, I have battle scars from those years, but uh, they were important ones, I think, to do ultimately. Again, if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, I just want to ask one more question, then we'll turn to our audience. But was it a struggle to maintain independence uh, at the radios? To what extent were politicians trying to influence? You talked about uh, during the Reagan years, especially, and Glasnost years. Uh, to what extent did you have the authority to kind of push back against the politi politics and the political figures? Uh, and how did you manage that? Well, uh, in the case of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, we had a bipartisan board, Democrats and Republicans, uh, which had been set up in the 70s. And it was a very cohesive board. So the board chaired by, by Steve Forbes, uh, we had uh, Lane Kirkland, for example, from the AFL-CIO. We had James Michener, the novelist on the board. Uh, it was a prestigious uh, board that really tried to maintain a certain sense that you could, you could have freedom to express within certain, I mean, there are all kinds of policy guidances that the radios had both VOA and you had to adhere within them. If you didn't adhere within them, then you then you had nothing to push back if you were in any way, but you would always be attacked. I mean, uh, we were attacked by Dimitri Symes in the early 80s for broadcasting certain things. We were attacked by people in the, on the Hill who didn't like necessarily Reagan for other reasons, but we were a convenient target to, to, to get back at the administration. So you had to kind of weigh those as well. At VOA, you had a charter, which was very, very important. And the charter said you present the news, you present it reasonably. So there was no problem with that. When Reagan made a, a, a stupid joke with a live mic that, remember, you may recall, older people will recall, that he said, I've just uh, annulled the Soviet Union. We're going to be bombing in, in, in uh, 10 minutes. Um, the editor of the Russian news desk called me up and said, what do we do? I said, well, of course, we have to go with it. Everyone else is going with it. Why wouldn't we? And so... I said, explain it's a joke. Don't tell them it's real. But yes, we're going to broadcast that as well. I'm sure the White House didn't like it, but you know, so be it. There's a 
what helps VOA to this day, and jumping ahead, VOA broadcasts in the greatest of detail both Trump uh, impeachment trials in Russia. So you could just get all the testimony because it's the law. The law says, the law of 1976 is you will present the news as it is known, whether or not the administration likes it or not. So that helps. But there's always back and forth pressures. There's always, um, we were fortunate. We were fortunate in the 80s that what we wanted to broadcast was pretty much supported. We wanted to do more human rights programming, go right ahead and do it. We wanted to put uh, Vinovich uh, on the air, go right ahead and do it. We were not getting that pushback, whereas uh, my colleagues in the 70s were getting pushback from whether it's Haig or whether it was the uh, the head of the USIA. So different periods presented different challenges. Great. We'll, we'll go to questions now. And the first question is from Michael Keyes. And he asks, were you able to broadcast on the 1983 shoot down of the Korean Airlines uh, flight 007, uh, the Chernobyl disaster? If so, what was the Soviet response? Uh, that was my first, the shoot down was my first week at, at VOA. So I remember that pretty well, <laughs> uh, September 1983. Uh, Yes, we of course broadcast that. I mean, just just so that people under everyone understands. And we VOA and RL had a newscast every hour on the hour, a fresh newscast prepared by Central News, Central News at VOA or Central News at RFERL, which basically was taken from the AP, UPI, Reuters, Times. I mean, it was the same news that anyone else in the world would have gotten. And one thing I would also emphasize, because this is this is sometimes not understood, that there was nothing that the radio has ever broadcast that wasn't part of what we would call the open source domain, two source domain. There's no, there was no secretive sort of report that we got from the State Department to broadcast that no one else would see. It was very, very clearly had to be attributed to two sources in the mainstream news that, that's available. Uh, Chernobyl was probably one of our really fundamentally important moments um, because, as you know, the Soviet Union was saying nothing. We were on the air and we were incredibly careful not to create panic. We, I recall very distinctly, we brought in, there were quite a few emigre physicians from the Soviet Union who had emigrated as part of the Jewish emigration. We invited a number of them to explain in Russian what poisoning could be like, what precautions to take, how to go about dealing with it. We contacted obviously NIH and other organizations in Washington as to various health measures. But this was one of our kind of tense, important, serious work. A lot of entertainment program went by the wayside, and we really focused on what useful, helpful, accurate information we could possibly give people without creating additional problems. So I think that was one of VOA's kind of moments where, where you really had to rise to the challenge. And I, and I recall we had a wonderful editor, uh, Irina Kellner, of our medical program. Uh, who took charge of it, and I think did a really spectacular job, as I recall, handling it. We have several questions about the religious programming. Uh, what about Islam, uh, writes Yulia Gratskova. Uh, did you have any spiritual programs for uh, programming for Muslims? Uh, and another uh, question about religious programming dealing with non-Orthodox faiths, especially Protestantism? Well, let me just say that, and, and I acknowledge that our lack of a Russian language Islam programming was our weakness. We, we didn't, and uh, we didn't, I think, not because it was, I mean, it was against that. It was more considered that is what our Uzbek service does. That is what our Kazakh service does. That I mean, There was a sense that the other, and we had services obviously in other languages. Uh, I think in retrospect, it was a mistake. I think we should have had a, a, a program, but you know, you can't always catch everything. And back then that's just not the way it, 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 it evolved. Now there was, in fairness, there was a program uh, of a more, I wouldn't say ecumenical, but more of a general kind of philosophical religion where, of course, uh, some of these questions would be raised, but it was not a dedicated one the, the way it was for Orthodoxy and for Judaism. In terms of the Protestant issue, that was covered by human 
rights programming. In other words, the human rights programming at Radio Liberty did a lot on the human rights activists of different religions who were in the gulag for their beliefs. And that is also where some of the Islam issues came up. But there was a lot focused on, on the, um, the suppression of religion as part of the suppression of human rights. So that was covered. But the bottom line is no, it was it was not uh, it was not something that radio should have done, but they didn't do. So we have several uh, organizational questions. Uh, one from Vladimir Paperni, uh, Paperni. Uh, VOA and Free uh, Free Europe, one organization or two. And the second question is, what do you think about another author writing on the same subject, Richard Cummings? Richard, who I missed that. Cummings, Richard oh, Cummings. Yeah, I, I, Rich is, a, is an old friend, a colleague actually from Radio Liberty, so I know Rich quite well. Very different books completely, his and mine, because he covered different periods. Uh, they're two completely different organizations. So Voice of America is a federal employee as part of my, my time, part of the United States Information Agency. Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty is a non-governmental grantee of the U.S. government. Uh, so none of the employees are federal employees. Uh, they don't have to, there's no classified material at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. There's just, it's a, it's a grantee of the U.S. government, which puts it at arm's length, uh, granted that the money does come. It has, as I trace, a history of being initially the first 20 years as a CIA-funded organization beginning in roughly 1971-72. It became um, funded through congressional appropriations as an open congressional appropriations funding. So they're just different in that regard. There are similarities. They're different. The Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty was set up as a surrogate broadcast. In other words, the idea of the Russian services, it would be a radio station as if it were broadcasting in Moscow. Or the Polish service of uh, Radio Free Europe would be a Polish radio station that happens to be in Munich, but thinks of itself as being in Warsaw. In other words, the idea is that uh, uh, you know the domestic affairs of the country are your number one focus, international affairs, and certainly the United States. Um, and there's a very um, curious line in in the, the guidelines that the U.S. government set forth for the radios is that Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty would not support the United States, would not talk about necessarily the United States, but it should not contradict the general foreign policy lines of the United States. That's the only kind of prohibition that it had. And so most of the programming of, of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty was very Europe-centered Europe and centered on the countries to which they were broadcasting. Our next question comes from uh, Sergei Schmeyman, uh, and he congratulates you about the, your book. And he asks, can you tell us something about the role of the radios today and what feedback they are getting? If I heard that correctly, that's Sergei Schmeyman, right? Yes. Well, first of all, let me say that I got to know his father very well through the programming and I came to respect him very much. Uh, his, his father, Alexander, Reverend Alexander Schmemann, was a contributor to Radio Liberty for over 30 years, both to the religious programming, but also to cultural programming, literature programming, and, and was a very important voice. And so I think that uh, I, I am very happy that he's on the, he's on the call. Uh, in terms of today's programming, and I say this quite often, that today's challenges are much tougher than they were for us in the 1970s and 80s. And I say that because, as Russian emigres would tell me, communism was dying. There was a, and I saw it myself when I was in the Soviet Union as a Fulbright IREX fellow in 81 that there was a tremendous turning to the West, an interest in the West among the educated Russians that I met. Uh, communism was dying. And so the radios had an, an audience that was eagerly seeking them out, people going to their villages to, to listen to programs because there was no jamming. When I went in St. Peter's and Leningrad back in 81 to visit some friends in the Dutch, the first thing they turned on was the radio. They didn't care whether it was BBC or VOA or RL. They didn't really much care. They just wanted to see if there's what was happening in the rest of the world. Uh, today, uh, I, uh, I follow the Russian programming of both radios. I'm on it occasionally as a guest. I think they're doing an astounding job 
uh, covering the war in Ukraine, which I think is extremely done very well by them. But I think their challenge is much harder because you know, in our time, we could look to the Russians and say, well, you're victims of communism, much like the Poles are victims of communism or the Czechs. And that would kind of create a certain bonding that I think now is gone because uh, today's Russia, unfortunately, has kind of picked up on this imperialist nationalist strain. Uh, and I think there's a resistance to, to it, uh, except among the very more liber liberal uh, intelligentsia today. So I think the challenges today are very, very difficult, but the radios themselves are very, very important, very much needed, especially, especially I think in terms of what is a post Putin Russia going to look like? I mean, we spent a fair amount of time kind of debating and discussing how the Soviet Union would evolve once Glasnost came, we even speculated what would a post-communist uh, Soviet Union, we didn't think it would necessarily fall apart, but what a post-communist so Soviet Union might look apart. Today, the question is, what's, what's going to happen after Putin's regime is something that the radios would be a very natural place to debate, discuss, explore those options and share them with as many listeners as they can within the Soviet, within Russia. Our next question, and it's a related question, comes from Patricia uh, Haywood. And Patricia asks, picture, uh, how do you think Radio Liberty would manage in today's climate of disinformation and conspiracy theories and the rise of nation states in disseminating the kind of narrative that Putin is proposing in, uh, in Ukraine? I would first of all answer that they're, I think, doing quite well, <clears throat> and then I watch them quite regularly. You can anybody can watch them on on uh, on the internet. It's very easy. There's current time. There's just just to specify. There's something called current time, uh, in Russian, that is combines VOA and RFERL together in one program. That's a news program, and then each of them have their own separate programs. I think they are treating it, as far as I can tell, for the programs I've watched, very carefully without engaging in a, um, you know, in, in any kind of a food fight. In other words, they're not going to say, well, Vladimir Solovyov on such a program, you know, it's a real jerk. He said this. Well, we think not. No, they obviously pick up what are some of the worst of the conspiracy and try to get voices in Russian uh, explaining a different point of view. Now, how well they penetrate that, how deeply they go is very hard to tell because as all of us know, people living today in Russia are not believing their own relatives who call them and say what's going on. So in that environment, it's not easy for the radios, but I think they're, the stance they have taken is to be a serious, thoughtful, you know, multimedia platform because they have TV and they have radio. So kind of a multi, and they're on YouTube. Hopefully YouTube won't be closed down, although that's a possibility. But I think they have a very hard, tough job to penetrate beyond a certain percentage of the population that would be open to that kind of view. Uh, our next question asks, uh, did you manage to meet George Kennan? And if so, do you have any ideas as to how he would, uh, how any ideas to the program uh, that, uh, to, to your book and that the uh, programs that uh, were, were broadcast then. Okay, I, agree. I have a great George Cannon story, but uh, I got to obviously read a lot of him in terms of the, he's kind of the father of, of, of the radios and, and really was very creative in coming up with this whole concept of surrogate broadcasting. And initially was even gonna be on the air, but he himself admitted that his accent was too uh, too heavy to be to be a radio broadcaster. I met George Kennan of all places in Leningrad in 1981. Uh, he came for this first visit back to the Soviet Union after having been expelled as ambassador. And the consul general of Leningrad had a reception for him. And since there were only about seven or eight Americans kind of hanging around in Leningrad in, in the February of 1981, uh, he invited me to, to the reception. So I came and I and I told Mr. Kennan that I read his memoirs in high school, which actually made a big, big imprint. And he looked at me and he says, young man, I think I've gotten into a lot of trouble. 
So that was my interaction with George Kennan. But yeah, he's uh, he's a very, uh, very, very important figure for the early years. Not so much maybe for, for my period in, at the radios, but certainly for the early period, very much so. And what were your impressions uh, with Solzhenitsyn when you talked to him and uh, met with him? Uh, what, what was your sense of him and his and, and obviously his ultimate return to to Russia? Let me contrast him very quickly with someone who helped me to get to Solzhenitsyn. I had met Slava Rostropovich earlier, uh, and uh, Rostropovich was just, you know, the warmest, embracing kind of guy. Uh, and when I got to Solzhenitsyn in Vermont in Cavendish, uh, he greeted me rather coldly, kind of surveying out to who I am and why do I speak Russian and how it was my experience. He basically spent the first half hour of our meeting kind of questioning me. And I, I write in the book, I think in a sense, kind of judging whether I was, you know, the right person to understand his art and would I be someone he would want to sit across the table from for, for three days as, as we were. But he kind of warmed up and uh, one thing led to another and, and we actually ended up having a drink and then I joined him for dinner with his family. And But the, the scene that I think most stunned him was his three boys at that time were teenagers. Uh, they had just come home from school and they had one kind of basketball uh, hoop set up. And there were three of them and they were playing basketball. And I had played on my high school basketball team in Vermont. And I kind of came out and I sort of jokingly said, hey, I'll join you for a little game. And I could just see the expression on Alexander Isayevich's face that this guy, this American head of the Russian service of VOA is playing basketball with his kids. I mean, he's both amused by it, but totally stunned that that I would do that. So that was kind of the, the kind of curious human element to it. But he was um, very serious, very much to, to the point of what he wanted to broadcast, but would occasionally, would occasionally relax, not often, but would relax. And then was a you know interactive, pleasant enough guy. And his family was very pleasant. They had a beautiful home in Vermont and we had a uh, wonderful uh, sort of meals and drinking tea and chatting. So I got to see the, the more human side of him, but there is that facade that is very, very strict, formal, and a bit cold, very different from most uh, Russian emigres that I met. Next question comes from Elizabeth Elliott, uh, who worked at the BBC Russian service and was its head. Uh, and she asked, did you ever want to work with the BBC? And what was your view of its quality? You know, in my days at VOA, we had the closest relationship with BBC. And that was very much encouraged. Um, matter of fact, I found the uh, NSDD, I can't remember the, you know, the National Security Decision Directive, uh, classif now declassified, but obviously it was classified then, which mentioned the radios and, and, and at the end it said, encourage the radios to cooperate with the radios of our allied countries or allies, something along those lines. And we did. We had, uh, I spent, you know, every year I would spend at least a week at the BBC Russian service. We would invite the director of the Russian service back then was Peter Udell, who came and spent time with us at VOA. Uh, we always looked at people to poach whom we could hire away. Uh, VOA had the advantage of offering higher salaries. So we, we were always hoping that, that would, we would be able to entice uh, one or two journalists to come to Washington from the BBC. We also had a very close relationship with Radio Canada International, with Deutsche Welle, with Radio France International, with Coal Israel. Uh, matter of fact, Coal Israel organized a whole conference bringing us together in Israel because there were so many emigres in Israel that we could then perhaps hire as, as journalists. And this was a this was a recruiting ground. Israel was a, was a big recruiting ground for, for the radios because you had educated native speakers of Russian who were looking for good, well-paying jobs. And so, uh, yeah, we, we had a close relationship with the BBC and um, we always looked uh, carefully at what they were broadcasting, whom they were using, were there. So yeah, that's, in a nutshell, that was a very close relationship. Uh, the next question comes from Joel Starr, and uh, Joel asks, do you have any specific recollections about uh, the Soviet reaction to Reagan's tear down this wall speech? Uh, 
not necessarily to the tear down this wall speech, but I should sort of tell you a, a story that I think may, whoops, excuse me, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, I should tell you a story that when we were negotiating in about 1991, I'm sorry. Um, when we were negotiating for opening um, more bureaus, you know, kind of freelancers and getting access to AM and FM radio, what surprised me was the extent to which the Soviets were agreeing to everything. I mean, you want this, you could have it. You want to go there, fine. And finally, in the course of these discussions, this was 1991, one of the uh, Soviet, um, you know, our interlocutors said, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee. Let's, let's chat. And we go away. And he turns to me and his face becomes very angry. And he says, do you realize, you Americans, that right now we are weak? We are going to give in to you. You can have pretty much what you want. You can have good space. But just you remember, 1991, when we become strong, we're going to throw you bastards out of here and you won't know what happened to you. And the anger and the and this is a soviet official 1991 still the soviet union really toward the tail end of the soviet union just that anger toward the fact that they were weak and they had to give in not that they wanted to but they felt they had to give in for other reasons uh and and the resentment uh that he portrayed has stayed with me to this to this day that this was far and away not the happy ending that everybody assumed it to be by the way i should say that the office that we opened the office that we were so proud to set up finally got closed in russia in february 2022 so it lasted from 19 88, 89 to 2022, now it's of course gone. Uh, next question comes from John M Maxwell. Uh, he asked in terms of impact on audiences within the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries, do you think that the VOA jazz broadcast of Willis Conover was one of the most impactful VOA programs? It was wonderful. And we had uh, Willis Conover who of course spoke in English, but we had a Russian broadcaster who would sit with him in the studio and kind of converse and translate what he said and they would put it on air. No, I think Willis Conover had uh, fans all over Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Soviet Union, China, and was a real voice. And, and, he, and he had a charm that I think really resonated. But in terms of music, I, I can throw in a little curveball in sense that I discovered that the American, well, con uh, composer called Vernon Duke, who some of you may know in terms of jazz in the 30s, a friend of Gershwin's, composed a lot of popular American songs, was none other than Vladimir Dukelsky, uh, a Russian born in St. Petersburg, who came to the United States uh, at Gershwin's suggestion, changed his name to Vernon Duke, continued to compose classical music under the name of Dukelsky, composed American kind of pop music and jazz under the name of Vernon Duke, and led the Radio Liberty music program in the 1950s. I mean, there are all kinds of gems like that that are, are embedded in the radios anyway. That's kind that's of an American Russian one. That, uh, another question from Michael Keyes. Uh, did you ever deal with Hedrick Smith? Uh, not directly. No, I know his book, obviously. And, and we all read his book in the 70s. But no, I didn't have any personal connection. Oh, I uh, should go just, just, to, just to clarify one very important thing. One of the most popular programs that Ra Voice of America did was called Survey of the U.S. Press. So every day, there would be a survey of all the main stories that the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and other publications had, would be brought, would be sort of translated or described in Russia and go back. So that for the Russian audience, the American journalists who wrote about the Soviet Union were household names, because every single day, whatever they wrote in any of the newspapers would be back in Russian to the home country. So that was another sort of transmission belt. And it was a very popular program. It also allowed VOA to kind of cover a broad spectrum because they were quoting US media. It's a very easy one to do. Uh, next question comes from David Sumner. And David asks, 
how did VOA and the radios conduct audience surveys in the target areas? Or obviously, could they? Or how did they? How did you learn more about the impact that you were having? Well, first of all, I'd like to make a pitch for a good friend of mine and a colleague, Gene Parda, who's just published a book literally in the last month, uh, who headed the uh, what was called then Soviet audience and uh, research uh, in Paris. And it was done, and he could obviously explain this in greater detail, but the nutshell was you did as many focus groups with people coming out as you could. Now, granted, the emigration was probably not representative of the whole country. It was tend to be highly educated in the case of 1970s and 80s, predominantly Jewish emigrants, but they cast a deep light into some of the aspects and they would do lots of focus groups and so forth. Whenever possible, they would try to at least conduct some kind of survey with other Soviets who um, had um, were traveling overseas, although that was also not a, not a very... Um, a representative group because they tended to be party members or rather important officials who would have permission to. So it was a combination of those factors. And then, of course, once the Soviet Union, once Glasnost really came into being, you could start getting Russian uh, groups to do, you know, like Levada and others to do surveys for you. And then that kind of opened up and we did find out after the wall fell and after uh, Soviet Union disintegrated, we did find that the KGB was doing a pretty good job of surveying listenership to the radios. And those archives are available. Some of them have been published in English. And frankly, they were showing higher numbers than anyone in the West assumed. So the KGB was sort of seeing it as a, as a greater threat or a greater danger. They also had, and this might people might find interesting, they also had uh, a, sur a synopsis of the main programming of BBC, VOA, and RFERL, especially prepared for higher party officials. And if you were an important party official, you would get a briefing uh, of what the radios were saying that day or the day before. And that was considered a sign of being a high level trusted official. So they obviously considered it to be important information. And in any society where you have such censorship, you need some kind of feedback from an independent source. And this was one of their ways of getting it. Uh, next question comes um, from Joanna Gwodzinski. And uh, she asks, during its history, did either RFE or RL discover a Soviet or East European mole within the organization? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I described one that I happen to know. Uh, his name is Alek Tumanov. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, he um, supposedly defected uh, uh, in, I think, out the coast of Algiers, swam to 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 uh, to the shore, and um, was eventually given uh, permission to live and end up working at the radios. Meanwhile, he was feeding the KGB with, I guess, information about what was going on, rather low level, I think, of uh, KGB uh, operative. But I think we suspect that his job was more to create an exacerbated dissension within the radios. In other words, you know, putting some anonymous anti-Semitic uh, slur of some sort on the bulletin board. You know, you never know where it came from, why it was there, but somebody was trying to create some kind of controversy. And then one fine day, he appeared in Moscow and gave a press conference. And that's how we found out that, that he was all along a, a KGB agent. So yes, and I'm sure there were many others. Um, the, the thing that keep in mind, though, that the radios per se had no classified information. So whoever, you're not going to get anything classified or anything secretive from it. I think it was more as a way, as I said initially, to you know create dissension, to maybe spy on others, maybe follow what was happening in Europe, just a place to, to kind of, and there have been on Czech service, Polish service have had them. So yes, they, they popped up over the years. Let's have time for a few more questions. One comes uh, from a, a questioner and she asks, uh, uh, are you following the evolution of VOA? What do you, what is your assessment of the quality of today's VOA, not just in the Russia service? I admit I don't follow the other services. And of course, one has to know the languages of those services. I occasionally 
come across English, but very rarely. So I really have no way of judging. I, as I said, I think the Russian service is doing a good job in very difficult um, situation in terms of reaching audience. But they're very good journalists. By the way, someone had mentioned earlier at BBC, uh, most of the Russian journalists at, at VOA had spent quite a bit of time working at BBC. There's a very close relationship in terms of, of staff. So I, I have one more question, and that was, is uh, how did the radios change after the fall of the Berlin Wall? and the advent of Glasnost and the ability for US newspapers and journalists to actually go to Russia and to produce news by, by themselves. So did the role of the radios change uh, with the advent of basically more competitors or did it, uh, did it say, say, uh, uh, stay true to its, to its service? I would say it was their glorious, glorious days because you were able to therefore invite Russian writers, Russian journalists, Russian thinkers. You, you, you became a domestic radio station. And because the budget and the capabilities of Radio Liberty far exceeded any radio station in the Soviet Union in 89, 90, or 91 in terms of being able to bring the world to a Russian listener, there was no other radio station in the Soviet Union could do, compete. And so you had a Russian language station with an office in Moscow, freelancers all over the Soviet Union and all the different republics reporting on things happening. Uh, and we were able to pay. So we were able to really get some of the very best journalists in the Soviet Union uh, on, on as either freelancers or as full-time employees. So we had the luxury of having more facilities, more money, more opportunities, better airwaves, and the world sort of at large to bring in. So those were, you know, I remember taking a taxi in 1990 and uh, the taxi driver was listening to, to the radio. He had VOA on. I mean, it was like, you know, to him it was the most normal thing in the world. To me, it was a shock, but but he had it on AM, you know, here's the VOA news from Washington, da, 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 and whatever it followed. And I think what, what is important, and I do deal with it in the book, is the extent to which the sort of intelligentsia in the Soviet Union gravitated toward the radios when they had that opportunity. I, I have a, a short description of Natan Edelman, the Soviet historian who was in Paris, still in the sort of dangerous 88, 89 period, who willingly and happily came to the Paris Bureau of Radio Liberty to finally freely talk about what he wanted to do his research and what he wanted to say. I mean, there was, a, there was this desire pent up over years to be on the radios as to do something really special. So I, I think those were, in many ways, the really, really glorious uh, days for the radios. And one last question. In, in the age of misinformation and disinformation and the internet and so forth, uh, can the radios play a similar role in terms of objective information, or are those days pretty much behind us? Well, we operated in the era where we believe truth mattered, and we now live in a post-truth era where I, I find myself quite overwhelmed and confused and, and rather quite despondent. So I, I think it's a challenge for everybody. I mean, it's, 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 it's as much a challenge for the radios as it is for, for NPR or PBS or, or anybody else who's trying to, uh, to do that. It's, it's a challenge for all of us. And I think the the disinformation, lies, conspiracies are, are all over the place. But I think what the radios have to do is maintain what we always felt was really at the, in the long run, the best thing we could do was a set of values. I mean, if you maintain those values, you, you will persevere. If you don't, then of course, uh, it's um, you're, you, you've lowered yourself. As I once told someone in an interview, you don't want to lower yourself to the level of Russian media. You don't want to get into a food fight with them. You don't want to be like them. You want to stand your ground as a serious uh, uh, and and truthful and critical and important, um, you know, media. Well, with that, we're going to bring this discussion to an end, but the book is Cold War Radio, and I recommend it for everyone who wants to understand where we've been and Mark has now very graciously talked about the difficulties of trying to go forward as well.
So thank you, Mark, for just a great conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, thanks to our audience. And we look forward to seeing you further at the uh, Kennedy Institute events. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Will. I really enjoyed it. It's wonderful.